A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Brothers and sisters, faith is a realization of what is hoped for, an evidence of things not seen. Because of it, the ancients were well attested. By faith, we understand that the universe was ordered by the word of God, so that what is visible came into being through the invisible. By faith, Abel offered to God a sacrifice greater than Cain's. Through this, he was attested to be righteous, God bearing witness to his gifts. And through this, though dead, he still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death. And he was found no more because God had taken him. Before he was taken up, he was attested to have pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For every, anyone who approaches God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. By faith, Noah warned about what was not yet seen, with reverence built an ark for the salvation of his household. Through this, he condemned the world and inherited the righteousness that comes through faith. Verbum Domini. I will praise your name forever, Lord. Every day will I bless you, and I will praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, and highly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. Generation after generation praises your works and proclaims your might. They speak of the splendor of your glorious majesty and tell of your wondrous works. Let all your works give you thanks, O Lord, and let your faithful ones bless you. Let them discourse of the glory of your kingdom and speak of your might. Dominus Fobiscum, et un Spiritum Tuo, Lexia Sancti Evangelii Secundum Marcum, Gloria Tibi Jesus took Peter, James, and John, and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no fuller on earth could bleach them. Then Elijah appeared to them along with Moses, 
And they were conversing with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus in reply, Rabbi, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He hardly knew what to say, they were so terrified. Then a cloud came, casting a shadow over them. Then from the cloud came a voice, This is my beloved son, listen to him. Suddenly, looking around, the disciples no longer saw anyone but Jesus alone with them. As they were coming down from the mountain, he charged them not to relate what they had seen to anyone, except when the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept the matter to themselves, questioning what rising from the dead meant. Then they asked him, why do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? He told them Elijah will indeed come first and restore all things. Yet how is it written regarding the Son of Man that he must suffer greatly and be treated with contempt? But I tell you that Elijah has come, and they did to him whatever they pleased, as it is written of him. Verbum Domini. Faith is the realization of things hoped for and evidence of things not seen. These words from our reading today from the letter to the Hebrews gives us a very simple definition of faith. It points to future glory. It's the realization of things hoped for, the things that God has revealed to us that are waiting for us who love him, who believe in him, who persevere in his grace. It's also, we're told, the evidence or conviction of things not seen. There are divine realities that our physical eyes do not see. Why we profess in the creed, even God who created all things visible and invisible. We are then given in our reading three models of faith. First, there is Abel, who we read about this past Monday, who offered the sacrifice acceptable to God. He gave the best firstling of his flock to God. He gave the best that he had to offer. This was an act of faith, and it gave witness that all good things, he was firmly convinced that all good things come from God. That's why he gave his best to God, and he trusted that God provided for him and that God would continue to provide for him. So he's a great example and witness of faith. Then we're given the example of Enoch. We don't know much about him from Scripture, but Genesis 5, verse 24 says very simply, Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Just that simple line, it would be good if we were known as those who walked with God. Right, The ones that we were known as those who know God, who love him, who follow him. It certainly is implied that Enoch was a man of great faith, because our reading today says that he was attested to have pleased God. And then the letter says that it is impossible without faith to please God. Right, so again, he's set up as an example for us. And our third example of faith in the reading today is Noah. We hear that he was warned about what was not yet seen. And again, that definition of faith, again, faith is the evidence of things not yet seen. And when God told him to build the ark, he did it. Now, one commentary notes that According to Jewish tradition, Noah was ridiculed by his contemporaries as he built the ark. And you can imagine that, um, being joked about and ridiculed as he is building far away from the sea on dry land. And yet that didn't deter him. He was convicted, this is what God asked me to do and I'm going to do it. So these three holy men and all the saints who have gone before us are models of faith for us, especially, of course, Above all the saints, we have the Blessed Virgin Mary, whose memorial you know, we celebrate today. They are all witnesses who have gone before us. And they're that great cloud of witnesses that we hear of in the next chapter from the letter to the Hebrews. And they're praying for us, and they greatly desire that we join in their company. And in our gospel today, we hear the familiar account of our Lord's transfiguration. And when he and his three apostles were at the top of the mountain, he was transfigured before them. And they got to see a glimpse of his divine glory. 
The gospel tells us that his clothes became dazzling white, such as no fuller on earth could bleach them. And to think that our Lord, who had been up to this point hiding his divine glory, all of a sudden showed it to them. They got a little glimpse of what heaven would be like, the glory of heaven. And that encouraged them. It gives the apostles encouragement and strength and reminds them that he will always be with him, with them. He is more powerful than anything that might come their way. The Lord again wanted to strengthen their faith. And they would need it as the, the Lord's upcoming passion would greatly shake them. And what a contrast it would be to think of what they experienced on Tabor. You compare that to the crucifixion. Right on Tabor, they got a glimpse of divine glory, what awaits us in heaven, the glory of God. And then you contrast that with what was seen on Calvary, that our Lord was beaten, he was ridiculed, scourged, crowned with thorns, and he was crucified between two thieves. Whereas on Mount Tabor, the crucifixion, at the, the transfiguration, he is surrounded by two saintly men, right, Moses and Elijah. So our Lord was strengthening them for that, that cross, that trial that was coming uh, in the future. And years later, St. Peter would recall the event of the transfiguration, which profoundly affected him. Even though that he fell, this still stayed with him. He wrote in his second letter, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. We heard his voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. So this nourishes our faith as well. This is an eyewitness who beheld the glory of God at the transfiguration. And again, he beheld him after, he beheld that glory after the resurrection as well. And this particular eyewitness, who's also our first pope, freely laid down his own life in martyrdom rather than deny the Lord. And another point from the transfiguration regards Peter's words. He said, it is good that we are here. That's a, a beautiful line. It, actually, it's emblazoned on Mount Tabor uh, and the church, the basilica there in Latin. It says, Lord, it's Peter's words. It is good that we are here. That's always something. It's always good to cultivate gratitude, to thank God for being with us that we are able to be in his Eucharistic presence or any consolation that he gives us, to thank God for that. These are great sources of strength. And when Peter said it's good that we are here, he expressed a willingness to make three tents, one for the Lord, one for Moses and Elijah. He wanted to stay in that moment. He wanted it to persist. This was what we're made for, to be in communion with God, to be in his presence to behold his divine presence and glory for all eternity. And if we encounter the glory of God in a profound way in prayer or at mass or at some particular moment in our life, we should thank God for that moment, saying, Lord, it is good. This is good. Consolations, we know, can be a great source of strength. And particularly, there are great sources of strength for moments later on when the cross comes, when trials come. St. Ignatius of Loyola in his Rules for Discernment says, when consolation abounds in the heart, we must consider the conduct to be observed in time of trial. And to sustain the shock, we must provide in good time a supply of courage and vigorous resolution. So when things are going well, or if there's clearly some grace that we're aware of, or we're in time of peace, it's good to think of, I know this is not going to last forever in this life. It's only in heaven that we'll have unending consolation and joy. But now that I'm in a good place, well, how am I going to react the next time a cross comes or a trial comes? And then we're strengthened, we're fortified, because we're clearly aware in a time of grace that God is present here. He's working, he's active. And so the next time I'm tempted or discouraged, I'm immediately going to act and renounce it. St. Ignatius then gives an outstanding piece of advice for one in the time of temptation. And again, this is something we can think about uh, when we're in a time of tranquility and peace. He says, the tempted man must persuade himself that with the aid of God, he is all powerful and that he will easily overcome all his enemies provided he establishes his confidence on the divine strength and is courageous. 
that's very important because sometimes, especially if we've been struggling with some particular sin or difficulty, we can get discouraged and say, I never, I'm going to keep, I'm never going to get over this particular obstacle. He said we have that firm conviction that with God's grace, if I rely upon him, we're all powerful, not due to us, but it's clinging to the Lord. He is all powerful, that with the aid of God, right, and if we have confidence in his strength, and he says to be courageous, we have to be firmly convinced that with his grace, we can persevere through any trial or temptation. And finally, just a brief point on the words of God the Father at the transfiguration. He says, this is my beloved son, listen to him. Remember, this is this transfiguration. This is right after the Lord was telling them that if you want to follow me, take up your cross, deny yourself. He was also telling them about his upcoming passion. So we need to listen to that and to be aware of that, right? That the cross does come in our lives. It's something we cannot avoid. They're going to come. So we should not be discouraged or given to a feeling of abandonment when they do come. He told us in advance that this is going to happen. It is easy. Again, we can easily let, because sometimes trials are very difficult. We can be overwhelmed. We get discouraged. But when it comes, we know that the discouragement or the trial does not have the last word. God does. And his grace is sufficient for everything. God is faithful and he never abandons us. And again, when we recognize a temptation or discouragement, we recognize it for what it is. That's a tactic of the devil. God's permitting it, but he's also giving us the grace to renounce it and then to move on. So we ask Our Lady's intercession today for that grace that we might always seek to listen to our Lord and to follow him wholeheartedly along the path to heaven.